Hi, this is intern Ben here at Shenandoah National Park, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about bats. Let's go! To start off, um, I'd like everyone to just take a moment and think about bats, and kind of maybe if you take a moment in our comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook, and just talk a little bit about when you think about bats, what comes to mind for you? Are they really happy thoughts? Do you associate it with something good? Or maybe you have kind of a negative thought about bats. Maybe you, you're afraid of them or they make you think of vampires and something dark and spooky, something like that. So maybe just take a moment either by yourself, think about what they mean to you. You could even discuss it with people you're with. Or you could come down to our comment section, but we just want to remember to be respectful for everybody's different opinions because we all might have different things that we think about bats. All right, let's just take a moment for that. Now I'll share a little bit about my experiences with bats. For me, bats were a really big part of my childhood. As a little kid, my mother used to read me the book Stella Luna, which is all about a little baby bat. When I was a little kid, I also went to Washington, D.C. to the National Zoo all the time, and they had these great big bats there when I was a kid. Don't have them anymore, but they were a really cool part of my childhood and something that I was always really fascinated with. So I want to share that fascination with y'all today while we're out here in Shenandoah. So maybe the things you think about bats, you know, all of everything that you might have posted in the comments or talked about with people or just thought to yourself, all of that could come from very different places. Maybe it's a personal experience. Some people will actually get their bat opinions and their bat thoughts based on where they're from, sometimes culturally and sometimes from where they were born and some of the culture that their parents passed down to them. So let's talk a little bit about that. For many people, like myself, I am a Westerner, American, European. So for me and a lot of people like me, we have this idea that bats are kind of a, a thing of darkness, a, a bad thing. So we have to understand where that comes from. So the idea that bats are kind of this negative energy, kind of this negative uh, force, comes from some of the uh, Eastern European countries, some of the Near East, we get this idea of vampires and that will come to Europe and that will come with us across the ocean. A lot of people are scared that bats will suck their blood and the vampire bats do exist and there's only three of them. They were named in 1810 by a French zoologist who explored South America and Central America. And bats and vampires aren't really attached to one another and aren't really connected until about 1894 when Bram Stoker's Dracula is published and goes out to the public at large, and then we really get this connection between bats and vampires and this really negative connotation to them, and a lot of fear gets associated with bats. So if you're a Westerner, maybe you've had that kind of experience with them. Other countries, like China for example, historically has viewed bats as a type of luck, and this comes from a particular phrase associated with Chinese culture, or historical Chinese culture, and that is Wu Fu which means five blessings in English. And these five blessings range from different things. Some of it's money and long life and things like that. Um, but the interesting thing uh, that ties bats to this concept is that word fu uh, in Chinese. The characters between blessing and bat are very similar when they are written out, but when they are pronounced, they are almost identical. So you get this, this interesting connection that is seen throughout some of Chinese history as well as Chinese art and uh, different things like that in the culture. So depending on where you come from, here in Shenandoah we have visitors from all around the world, so we want to acknowledge that different people have different interactions with bats and things like that. So that's a super cool piece of history. So now that we've looked at them culturally a little bit, let's talk about some of the myths that we have about bats that might concern some of us still today. One of the things I hear a lot, um, going caving and things like that, is that people are afraid that bats will get caught up in their hair, that bats are going to fly in because they think that they can't see very well. And for one, Bats actually see really well, especially in places that are dark, like caves or at nighttime when they're usually most active or where they are most active. So they're not going to fly in their hair, into your hair any more than a bird will. They're really sensitive, they're able to see super well in those dark conditions, and they want to avoid you just as much as you probably want to avoid them. So they will avoid your hair and they're not going to get caught up in there. A lot of people are also concerned that bats uh, are a huge vector for rabies. They're concerned that they carry them at a much higher rate than other animals. And actually, bats do carry rabies to the same extent that other wild animals do. So such as canines and felines that we find out in the wild, bats will contract rabies at roughly the same rate. The difference between bats and other animals is that humans, A, don't come in contact with them as much, and B, bats don't become as aggressive as other animals 
and they're so small usually that they won't be able to bite you sufficiently to, to pass it along. So that's some of the really, uh, some of the big myths that we really concern ourselves with uh, when we're afraid of bats or something like that. Another misconception we have about bats is that they're only found in caverns and really big caves and things like that. But here in the park, here at Shenandoah, we have bats that live all over in different kinds of places. We do have some that lives in caves and caverns and under rocks and things like that, but we also have two types of bat that are tree living. So living trees that exist, they're full of leaves and things like that. We have bats that will suspend themselves in there and will give birth to their, to their young in there as well. And so all of those different things we have living trees, we have dead trees, we have these big rocks, and we have bats that live in all of those different places across the park. So they're not just cave dwelling animals. And that's a big misconception that a lot of people have. So kind of talking about all these different myths, we wanna make sure that we're moving forward educated about bats. And I'm gonna to continue to do that as we move through the rest of this program. So now that we've talked a little bit about bats generally and some of the myths and kind of historical significance of bats uh, in different parts of the world, we're going to move a little bit more into bats here in Shenandoah and their specifics. So let's talk a little bit about the size of our bats. A lot of people think that bats look like this. Pretty big, pretty good sized bat that we have here. These are two of my little friends. Um, but this is a really big bat. This guy has a 24 inch wingspan and most of our bats are a little bit more around this size, little tiny guys. So this one has about a 10 inch wingspan if you extend his wings fully. And that is a lot closer to the bats that we have here in the park. Our bats are somewhere between about eight to 15 inches in wingspan. And that's a, and some of them will weigh as little as 0.1 ounce. That's as little as one penny. So those are some pretty light bats. And those are found all throughout the park here in Shenandoah. So the bats that we have here are really important for not only the park, but also for the area as well. And part of what made this area a really good piece of farming land for a while too. So bats are really important because, uh, especially the bats that we have here, because they're insectivores. Now, you and I are omnivores and different types of animals are carnivores or herbivores, and it means they eat uh, different things. Well, an insectivore, you guessed it, eats insects, and that's their whole diet. They don't eat anything but bugs. So these little tiny bats survive off of the, all the different bugs that we have here in Shenandoah. Those are things like mosquitoes, beetles, moths, even butterflies and things like that. So all of those different insects make up their diet and that's really important because without these bats, without these little guys, we'd have a lot more uh, mayflies, we'd have a lot more mosquitoes and things that'd be bugging us, gnats, all of that stuff are eaten by these little bats. So if you don't like bugs, you should love bats. Um, the, some of the other bats that we have here, some of the slightly larger ones, getting up to that 15 inch wingspan size, will eat larger beetles and things that actually prey on different types of crops. So the farmers around here who are growing different types of things would probably enjoy the fact that the bats are eating all the beetles that would like to ruin their crops and things like that. So all of these insect eating bats are actually taking down the number of insects that we have here in the park and helping to keep it a little bit nicer um, away from all those little pests. As well as that, these bats actually, when they poop with their bat guano is full of this really important thing called nitrogen. And nitrogen is super important for all types of plants. They need it to live and grow. It's super important. So when these bats are flying around or living in a tree or something like that, when they when they have to go to the bathroom, they leave behind that guano and it's actually really important for the trees that we have here, for some of the crops as well. It makes the soil really fertile. It's really important for the growing of plants that we have in Shenandoah. Bats here in Shenandoah are also really important because they fill a very specific niche. niche. And that is that they are both predator and prey animals here. As we talked about, they are the predators of insects. So all those different types that we discussed earlier, they're all chasing after them, eating those different things. But they're also prey animals for things like hawks and vultures and other different types of, of raptor birds that exist here in the park. And also for some other birds, some of our very small, smallest bats, like the eastern small-footed bat, um, are actually prey animals for things like blue jays. When they can't find other sources of food during the winter time and the bats are hibernating, they actually become a prime target for different birds looking for, looking for an easy meal, an easy source of protein during the winter. So that's really important. From there, uh, we also have nine different types or different species of bats here in the park. 
Of those nine bats, four of them are viewed uh, by the state as endangered or threatened, and two of those four are viewed federally as endangered or threatened. And that's really important to make sure that all of our bats are properly taken care of, and we acknowledge that these animals are, are in danger, and so we can do our best to make sure that they continue to survive and things like that. Some of the things that help prevent uh, or help to stabilize these populations are actually bat offspring. Now, most of the bats that we have here in the park will give birth to a, to a litter of one to two small baby bats, um, most commonly one, though a lot of ours average two, thankfully. And there are actually two types of bats that we have here in the park, the eastern red bat as well as the hoary bat, which are both tree-dwelling bats that can have up to five pups in a single litter. So that really helps to stabilize their populations, though the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries does mark them as uh, still threatened and still under concern and in need of conservation. So even though their populations are starting to stabilize a little bit, uh, we still need to understand that they're, they're in need of conservation. So let's talk a little bit about those, those, some of these nine bats that we have. So let's start with our most common one that you'll, you might see if you visit the park, maybe in the summertime, late in the evenings, uh, you might see one flying around possibly. And that's the big brown bat. It's one of the largest bats we have in the park. It's one of the most common as well. Uh, the best thing about this bat is that because of its size and its usual flight pattern, it's one of the most easy to see and identify here in the park. And they're really common because of their resistance to something called the white nose syndrome, which we'll get a little bit to later, but they have proven very resistant to this disease and this fungal growth is affecting a lot of our other bats that we have here in the park. Usually they roost alone and during the summertime their maternity colonies tend to form in human-made buildings such as barns or outhouses, things like that, even attics as well. So if you ever find one in your attic, probably it would be best to call uh, local wildlife assistance to, to remove said animals. So you might want to wait till the fall when the babies are all grown up and can fly away on their own as well. We also have the northern long-eared bat in the park, and this one's really interesting because they tend to nest by themselves, and they usually nest in caverns mostly, or large caves and things like that. So these bats uh, here in the park when they nest, they primarily nest alone, or if they do nest in either a hibernation setting, they will actually nest with bats of other species, which is a little bit uncommon. So you'll have one of these a uh, bit larger bats, maybe in a very small uh, bat species, uh, hibernacula or place that bats hibernate, like a cave or something like that. So all of that is really interesting about the northern long-eared bat. From there we're going to talk about the eastern small-footed bat, and where I'm sitting right now on these talus slopes is a great theoretical uh, habitat for them. Uh, they really like rock outcrops and spaces underneath talus slopes and rocks. It's really one of their most um, habitated places. They really enjoy those areas. And they have a really interesting habit during their hibernation season is they want to get as close to freezing as possible. Other bats will tend to stay in slightly warmer places, try to conserve some of that body heat and things like that when they go into hibernation, but the eastern smallfoot really wants to get as close to freezing as possible because it's such a small bat. That's the bat that we talked about earlier that weighs as little as one penny. So that one wants to conserve as much fat as possible so it gets really, really cold during those times. We also have the small brown bat very similar to the large brown bat, we have the small brown bat, and it used to be really, really common in this part of Virginia and across the United States, actually. Unfortunately, the white nose syndrome, uh, a certain type of fungus, which we'll talk about in just a moment, is responsible for killing almost 99% of the eastern, uh, or the s small brown bat population. So that has been really devastating here in the park, and they only have about one pup per year, so it's really hard for them to bounce back from such a, such a difficult uh, disease. So one of the things you've heard me talking about quite a bit through this program is something called white nose syndrome. And this is actually a fungus that occurs in bats throughout North America. This actually occurs over in Eurasia naturally, but has been transported to the Americas in about 2006 through the state of New York. Because of this, all of our bats here in America, or most of our bats, are actually suffering from this disease, from this fungus that actually grows on them during the winter time. Because our bats hibernate and are very still, very uh, cold and things like that during the winter, this fungus is able to grow on them really well. This fungus is known as Pseudogymnoascus destructans, 
We're just going to call it PD for short, makes it easier on you and me. Um, or white nose syndrome. So this white nose syndrome affects seven out of the nine bats we have here in, here in the park. The big brown bat is not affected, and that's why it's one of the most common bats you're going to see in the park, because its populations have remained fairly stable throughout this time. However, a lot of our other bats have suffered greatly. Here in Virginia, the uh, populations such as the eastern small-footed bat have suffered 99% population losses. Across the United States, this is pretty uniform. 90% is about the average population loss for bats affected by white nose syndrome. Now this arrived in 2006 and was in New York and has since spread to 33 different uh, states here in the United States, as well as seven provinces in Canada. So it's pretty widespread. And the reason that our bats here are so susceptible to this is because it comes from Eurasia, where the bats there were very used to it. It, was, it grew in their caves and things like that, and they were able to evolve with it over hundreds of thousands of years. However, the bats here in North America are not able to deal with it as well, and that's why we have so many species that are susceptible to the effects of this white nose syndrome. Now what happens is that this uh, fungus will grow on the faces of bats, primarily their nose. That's why it's called white nose syndrome. And it is this white kind of fuzzy fungus that grows along their noses and along their wings as well. And it can cause them to, they have to work a lot harder when they're flying around and everything like that. It's harder for them to breathe. It's harder for them to fly. So they're using up those fat reserves that they're supposed to be storing for the winter time. And as that kind of works down and they aren't able to store as much fat on their bodies, years and years and years will go by. And when it finally gets to a point where they can't store as much fat for the winter, they will finally succumb to this disease, this white nose syndrome. And, it, and because it takes so long to spread and grow, they can spread it to a lot of other bats. They can spread it to different caves. And it can remain there in the caves dormant uh, and growing on the caves even when it gets warm. And then when it gets cold again and the bats move in, um, because our bats, bats throughout North America, do actually move around. They migrate just like birds do. And so they have to go to all these different hibernacula, all of these different places to hibernate, and they will spread the fungus into those caves. So a healthy bat might visit a cave that has this, this PD in it, and it will contract the white nose syndrome. And then it might spread it to another series of bats that it roosts with. So it's very dangerous and it's very difficult to control and get rid of. For this reason, we want to make sure we're extra aware of it. So if there's anyone that goes caving or anything like that, especially places that bats roost or are known to roost, one of the biggest things you can do to help prevent the spread of white nose syndrome and PD yourself is to disinfect your clothes as soon as you get home. Wash them really well, really hot water to get rid of this fungus growth. And that way, in case you go caving somewhere else where bats stay, and maybe it's not infected with this PD yet, we can help minimize the amount of spread that there is. So that's really important uh, for protecting our bats. And these bats, on average, again, 90% losses across any population affected by this white nose syndrome. So a huge loss for bat populations across North America. So just wanted to, we're coming to the end of this program now. And as we've talked about kind of the conservation and the importance of protecting our bats that we have here in the park. Just a couple other reminders or some other things that we might want to impart on you before we, before we wrap up. Um, as we said, 90% bat loss um, in species affected by white nose syndrome. That's a huge problem. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not disturbing bats during their hibernation period. So winter time, if you're ever in a cavern or you're going caving or you're here in the park and you happen to cross any bats or any, anywhere even, but if you happen across any bats, the biggest thing is we want to make sure to leave them alone, especially in the winter time. In the summer when they're roosting, it's not as big of a problem, but we still want to make sure that we're giving them their proper distance. Just like any other animal, just like if they're deers or bears that we have here in the park, we want to make sure to give them a really good distance. We want to try to do the same for bats because they're very sensitive animals. They have very uh, powerful ears. They can hear a lot of things going on around them, so we want to make sure to be nice and quiet when we're passing by bats. If you ever come in contact with them when uh, the winter time is happening and they're all hibernating, we just want to make sure to be really, really cautious because that's a time that these bats really need to conserve that energy and stay asleep because when they come out of it, when they come out of that hibernation period, it consumes a lot of their energy and getting back into it can be really hard 
and there's not as much food for them during that winter time when they're supposed to be feeding on insects and things like that. So we just want to make sure to give those bats as much space as possible. Um, from everyone here at Shenandoah, I want to thank you for joining us on this program. I hope you learned a lot about bats. I hope that you know you feel more educated and maybe you have a different understanding of bats now and you're more excited about getting to see one sometime or just knowing that maybe they're not as harmful as, as you initially thought. So I hope that we can impart some of that knowledge on you. Uh, if you have any more questions about bats in the park, uh, you can check our website. Uh, or maybe even our mobile app. Uh, Shenandoah National Park has a mobile app and we have a wonderful website that has tons of different information about the park itself and the animals that we have here. So this is intern Ben here at Shenandoah National Park and I wanted to thank you again for joining us on this program. I hope you have a great day and hope to see you in the park soon.